Welcome everyone to our panel discussion, The Faces of Homelessness. We are really super grateful that each one of you is here since we are all an important part of this discussion. And Hope, that is sponsoring this event, wants to give a big shout out first to the Longmont Museum. The Longmont Museum has donated the space and has donated use of the tables and the chairs and the sound system and even a playful time when Justin and I were setting up. He donated that. I did not have to pay him to laugh with me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and second, we'd like to give a big shout out to the Longmont Community Foundation. Eric is here. Many, many if not all of you know Eric quite well and they support our community in so many diverse ways. They have sponsored the food and the drink for this event, and we are super grateful to them because they support us in so many other ways as well. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> and Longmont Public Media, standing right here, Emily and Stephen, they are donating their time tonight to make a professional recording of this panel discussion. So we are super grateful for your time and your expertise and the way you're making it possible for the word that is broken open here to go forward and reach many more people. Thank you. Great, great. Well, there are so many agencies that participate in being part of the solution to this issue that remains in our midst as human beings. And before I introduce our panelists, I wanted to let you know and just remind you how tonight goes. This is a conversation among friends. This is a chance for us to open our minds and our hearts to look at things in new ways, to consider new innovative solutions and possibilities, to draw together in an area and an issue that can be really fraught with tension and misunderstanding and fear. And our time together tonight is to help to allay that experience, even if it's just a little bit. So we hope that after tonight, you will take the conversation even further. Don't let tonight stop you. Don't let tonight be the where you stop with this conversation. <laughs> Thank you. So from now until about seven, a little after, we have wonderful questions curated for our panelists, and I will be randomly throwing them out to our four panelists. Then at seven, we're going to open up the microphone here, if you're comfortable, for you to ask a question, for you to present a comment or an idea, and I'll just remind you when you come up here to turn this way and smile at the camera. It's not candid camera, it's not hidden. But, uh, and if you're not comfortable coming up to the microphone, but you have something you want to say, just stand up and I'll be happy to repeat it so that the panelists can hear. Then after we have a few open questions, I'd like to invite up Joan Peck, our mayor. She has a few words to share with us towards the end of the evening. And then at the end, if it's not dark, cold, windy, or too late, we have many of you out there with an action step. As we talk deeply about this issue, these four panelists came up with a whole slew of action steps because it's always nice to know what we can do after we talk about something very challenging. So there are many of you out there with action steps and if the elements make it possible, we're gonna invite you to stand up and share your action step. You can also get copies from me and you can also get them digitally if you email me. So we have newsletter sign up there that will go to all four agencies. Are you guys ready to get started? All right, if anyone's comfortable to come a little closer, we won't be asking questions to anybody in the front row. <laughs> Second row will get the question, not the front row. So if you feel a little <laughs> audacious, come and join us up in the front row. All right. <laughs> so first I'd like to introduce, you know all of these people, I'm sure, but they deserve an introduction because of their devotion in service to our community. And first is Alice Sweltenfuss, our Executive Director at HOPE. <laughs> After contributing to the education system for 30 years, she stepped on board with HOPE. She's been with HOPE seven years now. 
or eight years. And she's deeply devoted to being on the front line, working with the homeless, meeting them right where they are. Hope exists that the unhoused may have a home, and we offer support to every person that they may live with dignity and freedom. Next, we have Shannon Collins, COO of the Mother House. And she brings her advocacy, innovation, and care to Mother House after serving as program director at Bridge House and Boho. If you're not familiar, Mother House helps those who identify as women, transgender, and non-binary, and works with them and their children, providing spaces of safety, respect, and kindness. Next, we have Melissa Green, <laughs> executive director of the Bridge House. She was a firefighter, and she was moved when she witnessed how those struggling with addiction were underserved. She left her job and has been with Bridge House now for seven years. Bridge House offers adults suffering homelessness who are able to work the support, the housing, and the opportunity to change their circumstances in a community of care. And then on the end, we have Tim Rakow. Did I'm saying that right? I never. Rakow. Rakow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My bad for not asking. <laughs> Executive Director of the In Between. He is a 28 year veteran in the nonprofit sector, walking alongside those that are marginalized bringing an understanding and compassion to the multitude of challenges so many face without support. The in-between supports families and individuals through these array of challenges with transitional housing and supportive services. So I would say we've got some pretty awesome panelists sitting before us, yes? All right. So we're going to jump right in, and I'm going to rely on reading these questions so that I give the nuance. There are so many seen and unseen factors contributing to this community-wide issue. We're here to unpack that issue, to bring a deeper understanding that can be a catalyst for change. Shannon, we have many agencies and initiatives devoted to supporting the unhoused among us. What is a crack in the system that makes moving out of homelessness hard to navigate? So as a case manager, it is extremely difficult for us. It is extremely difficult for us to navigate all the different systems because all the different systems have, have um, cracks in and of themselves that people need to jump through or jump under or jump over. And it's very difficult for someone who is in a state of trauma, who is just fighting to survive, to navigate all these different systems. One of the things we need to do as agencies is to all come together in Boulder County and really collaborate together because we cannot overcome these cracks in the system unless we are all working together and we are communicating on a daily basis. It's gonna take all of us all of us to help with this homeless problem in Boulder County. And there are so many cracks, like so many people have mental illness for different reasons and it can take up to three to six months to get just an intake. That's, that's not an appointment with the therapist, that's an intake. Um, you know, it, affordable housing, there is none. There's not enough housing to go around for everyone and what there is available is very coveted and there are wait lists that are years long. So it's not as easy as, oh, let's just house them all. There's nowhere to put them. So what do we do in the meantime? That's, that's the big question. And that's why we need to all come together and, and solve these problems of all these cracks that appear. The word crack came up a lot as we were preparing for this panel because whenever we take on a very difficult issue, we're not able as human beings to understand all that goes into that issue and how we can meet it effectively 
as a community. So a crack is an understandable opportunity for us to see it, address it, and come together around it. And I wanted to invite Melissa to speak as well to low barrier access point. Here's a crack, but maybe you aren't that familiar with that term. Will you share more? Absolutely. So one of the things that we know working with the population is not only are there cracks in the system, meaning that there are not enough resources out there for people to access at a very low barrier status, meaning that they can walk into one door and talk to multiple resources um, in one place so that they're not having to take the bus from location to location to location, which is very difficult. I mean, in our daily life, when we're out working and running errands and we have, you know, a list with five different things to do and they're all in different parts of town, you know, we can jump in our car or on our bike or get on the bus. It's not that difficult. However, for our homeless population, they're carrying everything they own on their back. They're more worried about where are they going to get some food? How am I going to charge my phone? Um, where am I going to sleep tonight that is safe? Um, so for us to really be impactful and really start to move the dial on homelessness, we really need to start at the very beginning. And I think with all the community partners, we've identified a lot of the gaps that Shannon was sharing. Um, we need a one-stop shop so those folks can go into one building and be able to see a medical doctor right there, see a nurse, see a mental health counselor, um, find somebody that might know a little bit more about housing and being able to do those assessments on the same day that they walk into the door. And that those that one-stop shop should also have a place where they can store their belongings if they're going for an interview or if they need to take a shower or do they need new shoes because it's cold out and their shoes have holes and you know the water gets in and then we start losing body parts there's just so many different avenues that we need to put into one place so that those that are experiencing homelessness really can have their needs met safely Thank you. And a scene challenge is the phrase cost of living. We all throw that word out there a lot. But Alice, how can you speak to the challenges of cost of living, particularly for those that are suffering homelessness? I brought this newspaper article with me. It was out of Saturday's uh, Times Call. And uh, the writer, the realtor, Tom Kalinske, if the article is Colorado Metro's in top 10 for highest price gains and most expensive housing. Double digit price increase in median single family houses and first quarter of 2022 meets 70%, outpacing the 66% of the quarter right before January of 2022. As mortgage rates rose in first quarter, affordable housing worsened. Um, that, that spoke to me that even uh, in the realty world, they see what's going on with us. When it hit me, it was two years ago when I was the shelter director and we're very proud that folks are working on self-sufficiency and they're saving money and they're working, they're meeting with case managers, and then we help them with first month's rent or deposit. And we just struggled and struggled. And I looked around at all these people who had jobs until COVID hit and everyone lost their jobs. But my daughter sent me the floor plan of her apartment. And in San Antonio, Texas, being a big metropolitan place, there's a lot of apartments and this wasn't the best but it was an apartment and it's what she could afford. And it was $545. And I stopped and I looked at this and I thought about the dignity of her receiving the floor plan and that she could afford $545. That has gone up to 600 right now. And I thought every single person staying at our navigation shelter right now could be in housing with the jobs that they have between the navigation program, the safe lot program that we have, everyone in our program could be housed and afford it out of their own pockets. And so um, I asked Kimberly if I could share that with you because working here for this long with hope, it wasn't until my daughter said, this is what I could afford, but look what I found. 
And so, Tim, you and all of us that serve in the arena of human services are very aware of the effects of trauma. But can you help us understand more deeply the relationship between trauma and ho homelessness? Sure. I guess first I wanted to say thank you, for everyone, for coming. I think it's an important conversation, and, and um, I appreciate being up here. I didn't want to, by any uh, stretch of imagination, uh, pretend that, that, uh, uh, that, that really maybe uh, many of us, or certainly my speaking for myself, am, am an expert in this area. Uh, but I certainly have witnessed and, and walked alongside a, a, a whole host of folks over the, over the years and have learned some from that. And um, I think that, you know, what we often see when we talk about faces of homelessness is, is um, you know, maybe a mi an image comes to mind and um, for, for those that, that um, have very relevant experiences, maybe a prominent one comes to mind that you'll see a person flying a sign on the street, street corner, what have you. And so um, I often hear that there are those that, you know, speak to that. But it's much more than that. And it's obviously more, uh, it, it uh, impacts all populations, um, ages, and um, indiscriminate in its way uh, when we speak around homelessness. But all of the folks that are in a situation where they're experiencing homelessness are are really living um, and, and suffering from significant trauma. And being uh, homeless and without a place to be is a traumatic experience. And um, and I think we, if we lead and start with dignity and respect and understanding that uh, the folks that are experiencing these things are um, uh, in, a, in a place where they're experiencing some trauma um, and we lead with compassion and awareness of that, then I think you know, the next steps as to where we go from here and how we solve these things um, you know, really are baby steps. It's a very complex situation, a very complex uh, challenge. Uh, it's, it's not overwhelming and that we, we can't be about um, the fixes to say that it's, it's just too big, too complex. Um, no, there are definitely some things that we can and should be doing, and we are doing. Um, and I think the, the um, uh, two that, that have already been voiced here that lead the way, um, the external factors are, are really around, yes, um, price points that are adequate and affordable housing um, on all levels, from homeownership to, to rental situations, but also beyond that too, um, external factors are you know, a livable wage and, uh, and certainly wages are not keeping pace and haven't kept pace for decades. Those of us that, um, you know, that are in our 50s or, or greater, uh, we're, we're probably fortunate to, if we are homeowners, come across uh, our first house that maybe was two or three times the cost of, or, of, of our, of our uh, salary or our income that we had. Um, today's reality that it's probably 10 times what a person's income might be as, as the initial price point. Um, and so, so it's, it certainly have gotten out of, out of context. And so understanding that, you know, what was once the case in our, our society back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s um, isn't applicable today. It's a different reality. Um, so therefore it needs new, creative, different uh, solutions for that. Yeah, thank you. I think a way to pull that all together is to ask you tonight to consider yourself, whether it's yourself or someone you know, that has had difficulty navigating this kind of loss in some way whether it's somebody that we've helped that is homeless in our community or whether it's somebody that's in your family or your friendship circles. We have many, many individuals right in our midst that are challenged on these very levels. I remember in 2007, I had dear friends who were single moms who lost their home because of some of the things that happened and didn't have other available resources because they fell through the cracks of having too much to have access to resources. So. On that note, talking more softly and penetratingly about cracks, Melissa, how would you speak to this multifaceted issue when it comes to city, county, state, federal cracks? And what are some of the thoughts that you have about some of the changes that we can bring about together? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, kind of already sharing my thought on needing a one-stop shop. I think right now there's not a better time than any for us to kind of rebuild the systems that we have in place for those experiencing homelessness. There's a lot of interest in those that are on the street. You know, there's, we hear about the camping bans. We hear about, you know, recently trying to say you couldn't live in your car. Um, so there's a lot of interest 
in, in, this, in this subject. And right now, the cities, the state, and the government have a lot of dollars that came from COVID that are sitting there waiting to be spent. So they have a timeline, and they have to be spent by a certain you know, time, depending if it's an ARPA or Build Back Better neighborhoods. Um, they have to be spent by the end of 2024. Uh, so right now is the perfect time for us to really de dig deep and look at the services that we have and build them back stronger so that there is money there for rapid rehousing, as Alice was talking. Um, when you do find an apartment, you have to have the first and last month's rent and a deposit, and that's a lot of money. And for those that are working or paycheck to paycheck or living in a navigation center, they don't have that kind of money sitting in their bank account, but we can make those dollars available. We can also um, put these dollars into homeless service providers, the nonprofits that are already doing the work. You have a lot of experts sitting here that have different niches in the homeless population, and there's several other nonprofits out there that are the expert in their particular field. We should be funneling money to those nonprofits so that they can build their programs and make them stronger so that our impact is greater. And if we can get everybody into one building where they have access to that with the dollars from the government, it would be an amazingly new system that would be impactful and we'd see the dial on homelessness start to move in a positive direction. So my, I guess, action step, <laughs> if I could jump ahead, is to really reach out to your policymakers, to those that are holding the purse strings and talk about what are you doing with these dollars that are available and how can we put them into our communities? Great, thank you, Melissa, thank you. So pointing to, in, to another opportunity uh, raise your hand if you have ever felt that you've been set in your ways about anything, ever. <laughs> Small, big, right, 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 right. Changing mindsets on an individual, collective, or global level is challenging. That is completely challenging because of the comfort and the difficulty that can be involved. And so we wanted to give a little bit of a reflection on the mindsets that limit us, that reinforce cracks. And one of them is our stress in America, which has strength and weakness, to independence in place of interdependence. Shannon, how might you speak to this mindset and this whole pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality? Well, I mean, that, that statement in and of itself is a fallacy. No one in homelessness can pull themselves up by the bootstraps. I mean, even everyone out here, we all had help throughout our life to become successful in whatever endeavors that we that we have chosen to pursue. Um, you know, no one is an island unto themselves, even if you feel like it. Everyone, everyone here, we, we all think, oh, this could never happen to me. I would never allow myself to be homeless. My family would never allow myself to be homeless. But this statement, pull yourself by your bootstrap, boot, bootstraps, just allows for that thinking of if you just get a little spunk, you just work hard and you focus, you can do it. You can do this by yourself. And that's just not true. It takes a village. It takes all of us to help each other. Um, there was a woman that came to my shelter about five weeks ago who um, I have known about 10 years and she was trouble with a capital T but she had completely changed if you want to call it she had pulled herself up with her you know she had pulled herself up she was now sober she was re reuniting with her family um, talking to her 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 family on an almost a daily basis and looking for employment and this didn't happen just her. It, it happened with multiple agencies, multiple case managers, multiple people looking out for her, including the police. And unfortunately, it was just too much for her. And we weren't able to, to help her with the resources that we had available, and we lost her. And I mean, she's dead. And this week I got an email in a phone call from a case manager in a different agency saying, where is this person? We've been looking for them because we have housing for them. So it takes all of us, and it takes all of us watching out for each other so that we don't all fall through the cracks because all of us can fall through these cracks 
every one of us here could be homeless for one reason or another at some point in our life. Thank you. Thank you. Well put. And we talked about there being many faces of homelessness, and in our discussion, a few demographics that you might not think of that we need to be thinking about, Alice brought up. Will you share those? Um, so driving here, when we were driving here, I passed this gentleman that can stay at our shelter, but he just has this aura of happiness about him. He's over 55, and he has a disability that, Laura, I know you're going to laugh out loud when I say this. When he walks into the shelter, it's like, hola, como estas? <laughs> and we, we just love him. And, you know, if you have some music on, and that's the happy side of homelessness. Well, maybe we'll do a little cumbia right now or something. And, um, and he's worked in Longmont for 30 or 40 years, and he should not be homeless. He just shouldn't be. So more and more we're seeing individuals um, of age, 78, uh, somebody who was 80, and, and this gentleman. And it makes my heart sad that this is also a face of homelessness right now. Michelle Wade is in the audience, and she knows what what I'm talking about, that this, this is now an issue where you're comfortable in your place and you're in Boulder County and you're on a very fixed income and now your rent went up only a hundred dollars and you're struggling. And maybe there are other reasons for this that add into it that we need to look at. But while we're looking and connecting, because we all talk to each other and agencies and cities and county representatives that are here. Um, but while we're checking into it, that person is homeless and that person, that person has never been homeless before. That's sad to me. Yeah, I think, I think that that's a really good point is that we have um, this new kind of population coming out that have been working in their community 30, 40 years, they have a home. Um, for one reason or another, they, they lose that housing. Maybe their family's not close or all their families passed away, their friends are gone. Um, we had uh, run a pilot program for Boulder City for a while, navigation and um, center off of 30th Street in, in Boulder. And we had the pleasure of meeting uh, a man that was in his 80s he had been living in his trailer. His family had sold the trailer. Um, the person that bought it said, you can live here, don't worry. Decided that they wanted to renovate it and use it for rental income, so he was booted. Um, he came to our facility, and because he had income coming in, he'd never been homeless before. Um, he didn't fall into any bucket other than pull yourself up by your bootstraps and figure this out. You don't have you know, any access to resources other than the shelter that has 50 beds that was really, you know, an aggressive shelter to try to move people out of homelessness. Um, this man had not been taken very well, um, hadn't been taking care of himself very well, so he had some open sores in his feet and he had maggots in his feet. So when he came to us, he couldn't even walk. He was in a lot of pain, he was obviously very sick, um, but he was able to stay in our shelter and we were able to bring the nurses in from Boulder Community Hospital, had wound care, uh, and just because we were really aggressive and scrappy with him, we weren't gonna let him just sit on the street. We actually did get him housed in Golden West because he had the money to, to do that, but it took us about eight months to be able to go from day one to being housed because it took that long for a bed to come open to go through the process to get him on the right level of Medicare and Medicaid. There's a difference. Most people don't realize that. So that is one of those gaps and, and one of those reasons that if we would have had a one-stop shop, which was what Path to Home had, we were able to pull in all the resources when we needed them. We were able to be successful, but it took months of our time and his time being patient with us. and. I think the joy of, of this, this guy is he, he wasn't as happy as your guy. He definitely was not singing in the hallways. Um, 
but his whole goal was to be able to walk around the block. So every day as his feet got better, he would get his walker and he'd get walking. And by the time he left, he was able to go all the way around the block. So he made me do that with him a couple of times and a couple of the case managers, um, just because we had become his, his new family, his community. And that is what we need to have more passion out there with, you know, serving our folks. Sure, I, yeah. I could add. Um, so earlier I had said that you know homelessness is uh, those experiencing it are it's, it's indiscriminate, and and then when we really talk about populations or subpopulations, uh, those that are in a situation of experienced homelessness disproportionately affects women, people of color, uh, LGBTQ communities, and and um, and uh, veterans. Those are some areas that that. Um, uh, we see higher numbers than, than what is of the general population the, of those experiencing homelessness. But I wanted to share, you know, we have a, um, on the other side of the spectrum, um, at the in-between, we have a, a young man who is um, a senior in high school, and uh, we house uh, students that, that are living independently in situations like that. He became homeless, he was, evic uh, he was living with his mother. Uh, she was evicted from the property, he was living with her at the time. She made a decision, to, they were living in their car after that for about, a handful of weeks uh, along the, along the way, he was discovered through the St. Green Valley School District area, one of our partner agencies, and so he was identified that way, and, and um, you know has since come to reside at the in between. But his mother chose to leave the state uh, rather than staying here for whatever those reasons were, and he wanted to finish his school, and and I think he probably recognized that maybe he had a better shot doing this on his own, mm -hmm. in a different way, um, and and so. That's the other side of things. So you've got folks that are on the, the front end of life and uh, without not a lot of uh, lived experience. And you know, what, what, what shot does a kid have without a high school diploma and uh, is otherwise a minor when this, this, is your, this is your beginnings, this is your start. And we talk about um, uh, those, those uh, you know, relationships or that we, it takes a village and it's not anybody that's doing it on their own. Uh, we all had support and need support along the way, and uh, similarly with this kiddo, you know, there are organizations uh, like ours, but others too that, that serve um, specific populations that uh, they can come to reside and, and uh, with that opportunity of housing, at least a roof over your head, then you can start to address and build those, those cornerstones, those block building blocks towards something bigger and better. And, and if we don't catch, when we're talking about kiddos especially, them at this age, when there's all kinds of potential in the life in front of them, uh, that's the best opportunity. That's when we definitely want to get involved and get integrated and, and become uh, passionate about uh, wherever they may be wanting to go in life uh, because that's our best chance. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great. And so we also wanted to point to a few other hurtful mindsets that just exist in the collective consciousness. Uh, whether we believe them or not, whether we are 100% free of them, whether we're still wrestling with them, the panelists came with, so with some great adages that are common <laughs> phrases uh -huh. that hold us back when our solutions. So Shannon, you want to share the first one? Yes. Just go get a job. <laughs> right? So I'm a homeless woman on the corner flying the sign, and you tell me to go get a job. I'm going to go get a job. So my first hurdle is I have a big backpack that has everything I own in the world, everything including my birth certificate and my social security card and my ID card, if I have an ID card, if I have a birth certificate. So I can't bring those into anywhere, respectively, to apply for a job. Well, let's go to the library. Well, they're going to see my big pack, backpack and I'm going to have to leave it somewhere with them, which I don't want to because everything is in there. And plus, they're only going to give me an hour of time before they scoop me out the door because, you know, I'm undesirable. So, I don't have anywhere to shower to go to my interview. I don't have any interview clothes. Well, go to Deacon's Closet. Okay, I'm gonna go to Deacon's Closet. But I have to wait till Thursday. But my interview's on Wednesday, and I don't have any money now to do bus fare because I spent it going to the library. And, well, didn't just stay at the shelter. Well, the job I think I can get is in a warehouse and they don't care about my background because I'm going to be working at night on the night shift, but I can't go to the shelter because it's a night job and it's past 5 p.m. 
So I have a big backpack. I might not even have an ID, which an ID, to get an ID, you have to have a birth certificate. Birth certificates can take years to get sometimes, depending on what state you were born in. An ID here is just as difficult. Sometimes it takes months and months and months, but you know what? I don't have an address. So where is my birth certificate gonna go to? I don't have a bank account because I don't have any money. And I don't have two forms of ID. I have an ID, but I don't have two forms of ID. So how am I gonna get a job? And then once I get a job, I can't sleep because I have this nighttime job, or maybe I have a job that goes just past 5 p.m. and now I don't have any shelter. I'm sleeping on the street, but I have to stay awake because I'm super scared because all these guys over here, they might come and bother me. They might even try to rape me. The meth head down on the other side of the bridge, they're making so much noise I can't sleep at night because they're having some kind of manic break. So I lose my job because I'm not performing well. And I kind of smell, and my clothes aren't clean because I haven't gotten my first paycheck. Thank you. I think we got it, right? Yeah, job, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Alice, you had one. Your, your mindset hurt me. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were moving on to the next question. I, w I would have to say all people who are homeless are alcoholics and drug users. And I just want to say that while there is a lot of that that we're dealing with, when we start uncovering what the deep issues are, People who never had their basic needs met by four, you know, you have to have those developed by the time you're four years old. Um, people who just can't access mental health, the mental health needs the way they need them, or just go try AA, and maybe they did, and maybe that didn't work for them. Um, but to put people in this square of you're a drug dealer and you're an alcoholic. Um, there are so many people out there who might have those issues, but there are reasons for it, and not all of them are doing those behaviors. There are, as you know by reading the news, plenty of opioid and meth issues with housed people right now that are causing problems across the United States with deaths. So we do have a problem in our collective communities on how to help people with the hurt that they're feeling. And I would just suggest to you that instead of ignoring people, there's not a lot of big things you have to do, but acknowledging a person's existence is one that I would recommend we do. Amen, amen. Can I say something? <laughs> yes. So this mindset is so entrenched that if you're a person who falls into homelessness, by some weird occurrence, and you're not disabled, you're not elderly, you're not an addict, you're not an alcoholic, you don't have a minor child, you're just a normal, everyday person, falling, you know, like, well, everybody's a normal everyday, but you don't, you don't have any of these stigmas attached to you, there are very few resources available to you. Like, literally, almost zero. That's true. And what's a mindset you ma named, Melissa? Um, probably my, my, my favorite sarcasm there um, is you're just lazy. You just choose to do this. This is what you're choosing to do. Um, and as, you know, Shannon gave you a really good kind of a mindset of what a daily, you know, life looks like for somebody that's on the street. They are working every second of the day so much harder than we are on our most taxing day. They are always, always thinking about, am I safe here? Am I gonna have food tonight? Where am I gonna sleep? Where am I gonna store my backpack if I do get lucky enough to have an interview? Where am I gonna find you know, my friend who I know at night we could take shifts in sleeping? You know, We talked a little bit about trauma and just being homeless in and of itself is its own sense of trauma because you're living in crisis every second of the day. So even when you're sleeping, it's really light and you're not getting decent sleep. So you can't even think clearly. I think we've all, especially if you've ever had children, young children, you don't have a lot of sleep when, when they're growing up. If that is your constant life where you don't have a chance to relax and actually get down to your baseline, um, you're working very, very hard. So there is not 
Um, I've met a lot of homeless individuals, I've met a lot of homeless addicts, and I've yet to meet a lazy one. That is not a choice that they're, they're making, and they are working so much harder than we are. I would agree. Thank you. And Tim, it's your turn, the mindset you have to well, share. I think, in, I don't have like a specific one, but I think in general, um, leading with judgment is, is generally naive because you just can't ca capture or, or really imagine what the, the scenarios are, you know, what chapters a person has lived to bring in for that point in their life. Um, you know, I remember um, when I had first started as a case manager some years ago, um, at that time my supervisor said, you know, hey Tim, this isn't about you. And, and it might be that that worked for you. You picked yourself by the bootstraps and we've all had struggles and those, those we've all had certain um, periods in our life where, where they were harder than other times, transitions, what have you. Uh, but um, you know, who's to say that we didn't have the, the appropriate systems in place, we didn't have models that we were able to refer to or that we grew up under um, um, or other kinds of resources or people to reach out to. Um, but, but ultimately I think if, you're, if that's the, you know, what, what a person might um, uh, uh, suspect um, is, is probably wrong and off in the first place. But I think that's kind of taking it and saying, well, this worked for me and I'm just gonna apply that same logic and it should work for everybody else. Why don't you just go get a job or what have you? And, and it's just very flawed and it because these, these uh, situations and the circumstances that bring us some to that point um, are so complex and there's so many layers. And we, I mean, you, we, uh, when Shannon was speaking to, you know, just get a job and all the other things that have to happen for that to, to work really ultimately, the, the culmination of that. There's so many more things you can add to that. You know, you can add transportation. What if you have a kiddo? You know, and do you have childcare? Do you have access to that? Do you, I mean, on and on and on. We can go with all the different barriers that come uh, into play. Uh, but when even when you talk about substance use, I think we have to, you know, understand that uh, people who are well don't use substances or abuse substances. Um, that's a mask of something, and it's it's something that you're 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 working through, or or it's your um, you're you're self medicating, and. Um, or often it's cases, your you're dual diagnosis, you may have a mental illness and you're also using to, 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 to manage that. Uh, of course, that doesn't work very well, but that's, that's the reality. So it's it, all kinds of different things here. And, and um, uh, so, so in general, just kind of going out and, and saying something on a limb is, is probably not the right and accurate statement, regardless of whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you so much. And so it comes back to us how can we ask new questions? How can we ask better questions that get us more to the heart of some of these issues that we're talking about? How can we ask questions that let us draw closer instead of divide us even more? Uh, another mindset that came up was that Social Security is enough. That program came about when the world was set up a certain way, and I think that when that program was instituted with it keeping in mind as people get older what they deserve to have after working all their lives in our country, we've seen over the years that it may or may not be enough. And there are many situations where that actually is an increased stressor with our individuals who've worked long lives and are looking to retire. And, and I would add one in as a philosopher myself would be the Protestant work ethic. So looking at some of these founding mentalities and ideas that seem to really harness the genius of America into productivity and success in a worldly way are some of the very mentalities that we, we maybe need to take a deeper look at. How am I still influenced by that? How is my city still influenced by that? And how can I ask questions about things on that level? So, so many levels to unpack. And we wanted to get to a couple opportunities missed. So, Shannon, coming back to you, you named one of the opportunities that has been missed, but we're bringing it up so that it doesn't have to be missed anymore. Great. So, I, I feel it would be very beneficial for our city and county governments, especially, and even our agencies to, to have committees or even on our boards, homeless people. Because why are we trying to figure out how to solve problems without talking to the people that are entrenched in those problems? We can't. 
you almost have to be homeless to really understand what homelessness is and, and how much it can affect a person. So if, if we formed committees of 10 to 20 homeless people and we talked to them on a regular basis and, and got their ideas and you know what what is the main struggles what how do we progress politically or what are we doing as an agency that is beneficial or what are we lacking what can we do better i think would better would be better for the community as a whole thank you thank you and melissa you had something to share as well so as as we talked and, and we did have a conversation earlier this week um, about some of these questions one of the things that kind of resonated for me is once we you know are able to find somebody you know potential employment and housing um, there's a lot that goes into being able to get them a job as Tim kind of touched having a living wage is really important inflation is huge and impacting us all we have to remember that we have to give skills to those folks that have been out of employment world for a while or upskill those that may be at entry level positions so that they can advance um, and take their family with them to that next level so that they're not always living in poverty. We need to look at how do we help them to advance. Um, so one of our facilities houses um, 44 individuals in Boulder and uh, we had a client that had come out of DOC. He had been in there for over 25 years and this, this is kind of why it resonated is as I was walking through the house and you know, I'm like, here's the laundry, here's where you can watch TV, here's the you know, computer room. Oh, by the way, it's free Wi-Fi. I'll help you connect your device if you have one. And I just kept walking and he stopped me and he said, whoa, whoa. He's like, what, what is Wi-Fi? I don't know, I don't, I don't, what, is, what is that? Um, so it made me really stop in that moment and think the things that I take you know, for advantage every day I can pick up my phone, I can turn on my smart TV. Some people don't even have access to that or understand how to use that type of technology, but we're gonna put them in a workplace where they have to use a computer just to be able to log in to get their paycheck or to you know, to take a vacation, they have to be able to put that into a system, or they have to log in at the beginning of a warehouse to be able to get in and it, you know, they have to remember their ID number and maybe it's a fingerprint. And so we need to stop as a, as a community and make sure that while we're rebuilding our systems and putting people back to work, that we're making sure that we're also taking them to that next level so that they can continue to advance. Thank you. Thank you. And to touch upon uh, what Melissa and Shannon have shared, uh, I'm no longer Catholic, but when I was in seminary, there was a social ethic concept that has stuck with me all my life, and that is the principle of subsidiarity. And that is the uh, concept that change happens when we keep the power in the most immediate hands possible. So touching upon what everyone has shared here, and this homelessness issue is a chance for us to look at all of our systems. How do we have the people who have the direct experience be the informants in the solutions? And that's not always easy, right? And it's a little bit messy but it, it can be bring about the most lasting change. So, all right, and I know that with that, um, I see this walking stick out here, and I didn't want that to go by without you getting to share that story. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Michael, many, many years ago, felt a lot of shame for not being able to meet the needs of his family and eventually drinking entered his fam into his lifestyle and the shame grew because now he wasn't provided for, providing for his family. So Michael became homeless and he was a painfully shy person. And the way our systems have been working in the past is we're getting to people too late. So we're not helping out with homeless people who are in their 20s and 30s who have mental health issues and uh, for whatever is holding them back. We're getting to people when they're 55 plus and the damage has been done. So Michael, probably the most gentle person I've ever met, um, said, can you 
and Hope and other agencies help me stop drinking and have a place to live. And so we worked on that, and there's so many uh, great organizations in our Boulder County and along my area. So as he needed to keep his hands busy and deal with the shame of leaving his family, he would whittle on branches. The flood of 2013 brought a whole lot of branches to all of us, and I would bring him on, Michael, what about this one? No, Alice, that's not good enough. Okay, what about this one? So I gave up, but he probably put 100 hours into this, this particular walking stick, and then he got into housing, and one day he approached and said, I'm clean and I'm living at a permanent supportive housing facility. Do you think you would hire me? And um, we said yes after talking to him for a while. And it took such courage because he was so painfully shy. And at the top of it, it says David. And David was someone who felt very comfortable sleeping behind the senior center in Longmont. And um, I think one anniversary, my husband and I, instead of going and having a nice glass of wine, we're like, well, we gotta go check on David. And David and Michael were next door neighbors. They both became housed in this facility way too late in life. And uh, Michael is no longer with us, nor is David, but they're here with me in spirit. <laughs> Great symbol about how we walk through life together, right? And all of these stories and insights that everyone is sharing here on this panel refer back to a quality that's worth hearing Tim speak a little more about, if you will, because you spoke so penetratingly about relationship, the influence of relationship when it comes to this issue and health and healthiness. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the key we found in, in uh, those of us working in this uh, uh, field um, is that relationships matter, and it's really ultimately about that. And, and where we can drive change, or, or at least, if nothing else, partner with folks and align with people, uh, keeping in mind that those who are experiencing homelessness are the experts of their own destiny. They exactly where they want to go. Maybe just don't know the steps and under com comprehend all the, all the, all the complexities to, to get there. But generally speaking, um, have a plan and a vision for themselves because where they're at is not what they want. Um, so working alongside folks, aligning with where they're at, listening to where uh, uh, their hopes and dreams um, is, the, is the work that, that is, is the most important. And um, that takes time, patience, and, and investment. And, um, and so it's not something you can just hurry your way through. But, but that is a, a key piece, I think. And, and uh, so I, I think most agencies, uh, that, that uh, quality agencies um, that do good work, understand that it really starts with relationship and um, folks that come to our doorsteps uh, probably have had a lot of conversations and had to justify their existence over and over again with many people throughout their lives especially if they've lived long enough um, or have been part of any system if you want to call it that um, and so so there there's it's it would be natural for for uh, really for people to have some resistance or to be you know cautionary with with uh, those steps of building relationship. But in time, when you can start to build trust and and uh, uh, there's a recognition that I'm here for nothing more than just to support you and where you would need to go and like to go, um, and and if we're authentic with that, then I think over time relationship starts to happen and then change can begin and in, in, in all kinds of great things. Um, but it really is about relationship and. Um, and and I, I, I was going to just offer, if I could, real, uh, real quick, uh, Kim, that um, when we talk about opportunities, I do think that Longmont is better positioned than many municipalities. We have, a, um, I think, a strong support in our, our, our government systems, city, county. Uh, certainly we have a plethora of, of agencies that are doing good work, but, but um, but I think to me, I, you know, keeping in mind our, in the back of our minds that, that this is a, a, these kinds of investments are the investments in our community and, and uh, they're important. So uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness are not cast offs. They're, they're integrated in our lives all the time. And, and um, I mean, I know because I, we work with a lot of folks uh, at the in-between, but, 
Uh, we have all kinds of people at the in-between that are probably checking you out at the grocery store. They're probably the ones who are brought your food if you ordered it last night, you know, your, your, um, um, through your app. You know, they're, they're bringing your, your food that way. Or they may be um, um, uh, the person who is, you know, uh, providing the landscaping service for you, you know, at your, at your home or for your neighbor or what have you. And uh, again, you know, on and on and on. Uh, there are the working folks who are contributing uh, otherwise just don't have a place in the community in, in, in way of housing. Um, but they should, and they deserve it, no more than no less than we, the rest of us, I think so. Thank you. And uh, another reflection question, you can tell I'm a big in participation. Uh, raise your hand if you have ever in your life been embarrassed by a weakness that you had. Maybe you wanted to hide it and not let somebody know that you weren't able to do something, or you failed at something, or, Right, right. And think of the courage it takes to be in a society that's fairly punitive and somewhat harsh-minded in many ways towards individuals experiencing weakness. So we have an opportunity as well to work with ourselves and recognize that the times we have felt embarrassed, those are the exact same feelings that those standing beside us have felt as well. So we're getting close to the end of our first hour, and I want to invite the four of you to contribute anything else that came to you after our meeting on Monday, something you'd really like everyone to hear and uh, think about. Yes? When talking about solutions, I think about every possible solution for homelessness that you can think of needs to be considered at the city and county level. So we have a problem with homelessness because of obvious situations that we've talked about. But every possible solution, let's do it. You have a great idea, contact your city and your county reps and let's stop creating ordinances and rules and laws that push people away. Let's come up with some solutions and back the people who come up with those solutions. Thank you. That's just right. I think that it's important to remember that there are so many reasons somebody falls into homelessness. Anybody, it's a loss of a job. It's a loss of a child. It's some kind of you know, trauma that happened in your life. There are just so many reasons that somebody can land homeless. There's double that to get them back out of that bucket, and we need to be aggressive and scrappy and we need to think outside the box because we can do this we can truly change the dial on homelessness if we band together and we're not afraid to try new things yeah shannon and tim anything you want to say to wrap up this first hour sure so i, I was just going to comment on on what you said about solutions and um you know and, and being at the city and the, and the county level is, I know in Boulder, I can't speak to Lama, but I know in Boulder, there are laws surrounding dogs that um, protect them more than they do human beings. And to me, that's really sad. Uh, let's see, a lot of things. Um, I guess when we are talking about key steps to moving forward. We can't talk about solutions to homelessness without talking about housing inventory or their, the lack, lack thereof. Um, and so um, the other pieces are all important and integral to the process, the supportive uh, components that we've been speaking to and, and, and understanding uh, what brings a person to a situation like that. But, but uh, obviously the severe lack of inventory, and this is a nationwide trend, so we're not unique here in Longmont. Uh, there's nothing special about us in that way. However, what is special about us, I think, again, is that we have a lot of goodwill and, and people in the right places and decision makers that, um, with uh, an interest in, in doing something. So I think to the point that everyone's already been saying, maybe I'll just reinforce the concepts of you know, being innovative, being creative, considering different solutions uh, to expand housing. It doesn't always require a 60, 80 unit building. There are lots of opportunities for smaller infill projects that can happen. Uh, and those are usually much more palatable in a given community because there are going to be those who are not in my backyard, the NIMBYs, and, um, but uh, workarounds are being creative. There's certainly been some 
uh, on the planning and zoning society of the city of Longmont, discussions around ADUs, accessory dwelling units, and, and being more creative with those kinds of things to add capacity. So um, the, the solutions are many. And yeah, we should probably exhaust all these different options or at least have many more discussions with the right, uh, the right uh, people in attendance and audience to, to expand on that. But, um, but yeah, I think that's just, we, we've only begun, I think, uh, the discussions and we need to do just a lot more of that. Can I say something to that? Yeah. yeah. So, so I'll, I'll share something a little private. Is I I live in a fourplex that looks like a normal house, and um, my landlord, you know, I've been there quite a, quite a while, almost a decade, and he has unknowingly helped three different individuals get out of homelessness because his rent is way far below market value, and just that alone has helped three individuals right there. Just. I, I don't need to go any any higher in my you know in what I'm charging my my renters. Awesome, great, wonderful. Well, now we can open up the microphone. I'd like you, if you're comfortable, to come up to this microphone and you can turn it right to our panelists to pose any question that you may have that's on your heart and mind that you've longed to bring into a safe space. This is safe here. We're all friends. And if you have a comment, if you could keep it to about two minutes, if you have something you really want to contribute. So come on forward. Hello, I'm Emily Hagen, and I am a resident of Longmont, and I have Im felt the impacts of affordable housing myself. So I love that your landlord keeps the rent lit low. One of my first ideas about housing was to give incentives to people who keep the rent low um, by having businesses in the community pour in some of their resources so that people could draw out a prize for keeping their rents low. And that sounds kind of small, but when you said that, I thought it could help. And so that's the kind of partnerships that I think we need to do. When the Chamber of Commerce thinks that the R Center is an enemy, that's probably not gonna help. But if the Chamber of Commerce says, oh, we can put our businesses in front of everybody who are housing owners and developers, and we can share what we have with people who are doing something good for our community, then they get something like a really nice dress at one of our boutique local places, or a nice dinner out, and it helps keep the rents affordable. So that's my first random idea. I have a whole proposal about it I wrote in the middle of the night. So I'll send it to you if you want, but that's um, one thought. The other thought that I've had is that mental health is actually stemming. Uh, the cost of not having mental health facilities is causing us to have homelessness, and I don't know if you know, and I know that this is putting you on the spot, Mayor, but how many mental health beds do we have in the city of Longmont? Okay, good. Okay, so I Googled it briefly while I was here, and there are 51 at LLP something long, some place, but there's really not enough. There's not enough in Colorado. So if we have this grant that can help us to figure out how to have more mental health beds, that will help. Um, my big dream right now is to have a place that would be helpful for women specifically because they are so vulnerable in terms of their own bodies being targeted specifically so that there would be a mental health facility that's close to a women's shelter that would help provide both of those needs. And so maybe we won't get a doctor and all of the things they might need, but if we could deal with mental health and shelter, I think that that would be helpful. I've got the shelter. So, okay, the Bring shelter the is good, we're done. The, uh, the other thing I, I know we, uh, is that people who really have this stuff, their backpack, and they have no place to put it, it would be great if we had lockers in the parks that were large lockers or maybe by that field where the U-Haul building was that are in the ground. You can't pick them up. They're really solid rock lockers that people can store their stuff in 
with not money, but like you have at the YMCA, those just codes, mm -hmm. and you put those in public places so that people can go get a job. They can go get a um, you know, place to take a shower or whatever. Okay, and final thing, um, those restrooms where there's a timer that helps that you won't stay in the restroom forever, so you know that helps make sure that people don't live in the restrooms. But they clean themselves. Have you heard of this kind of restroom? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, I think we need at least five of those in Longmont. <laughs> so those are my ideas. Um, I am a pastor in Lyons and Lafayette, and I will soon be in Lafayette and Louisville. And it's just on my heart that these people who are here in our community need more resources, and we can do it. So let's use all that money that the state and the county gives us and target it to people who really need it the most. Right. Woo! Yeah, girl! <laughs> I'm sorry. No. We're Bingo. running out the gate with innovation. <laughs> Tough to follow that. <laughs> all right. Who would like to come up next? Yes, come. <laughs> I want to wish I was taller. <laughs> Thank you. I want to thank Kimberly Braun for allowing me to be her interview. And um, can anybody hear me? Okay. So I have thought so much about this when this discussion was going to happen. And sorry. <laughs> I lost my mom two years ago on Easter Sunday. I brought her home to die, but prior to that, what few people really know is that she ended up in a rehab center. And at the end, I was not able to work. I was really sick and on disability. And a friend took me to the rehab center. I live in Loveland, but this idea, this comment can be even for Boulder and Boulder County, and the social worker said, well, we can, we can just take every asset that there is. If she can't go home, it will just take everything, and that'll also include the house. And a dear friend of mine said to the social worker, well, what happens, what happens to her daughter? Oh, we're not concerned about that. We're concerned about the client here in the nursing home. So, as it turned out, they weren't able to take the home, that did not happen. But I spent many, many years worried as someone with a limited income trying to finish their college education, what was going to happen with a family that is interdependent on each other. And I heard that word mentioned a couple times and it almost seems like it's been a nasty word in our culture to be interdependent. And they never quite got that, the social workers. And I really, really wish that there were social workers that could come into play when they see that there are vulnerable people and assist, assist not just the, the elderly person that is in the assisted living or the rehab, but step in before we have a major crisis. And it all just came together and I thought, why don't we have this? Families help each other all the time because we're family. But then I saw how vulnerable I was to homelessness and how I crossed my fingers for five years hoping that we didn't have to lose everything. And I would much rather have my mom still here. <laughs> but there were some very hard times and people did say that to me when I was like, just go out and get a job. Go find an apartment. And I was on the waiting list for five years. And then right when I brought my mom home with hospice, they called, oh, your voucher came up. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, I think, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, and I'm sorry for the loss of your mom. But you, you, you identify, you know, a huge gap in our system um, 
again, you, your mom had her home, she had worked, she had you know income, you had your disability, but it only takes a very small bump in the road to knock off an entire family, and that's a generational loss. So it, it's not gonna go, that, that doesn't go away quickly. Um, and it breaks my heart to hear whoop, how, how families are put into the situation of you can either have your loved one having medical care in a facility or you take them home and they don't receive any care because you're gonna lose a house, you're gonna lose a bank, you're gonna lose everything that's you know going into that household. And you're right, families take care of families and we need to extend that broader. As a society and as a community, we need to take care of each other. And there's no reason why we can't make the systems protect everybody that is out there and suffering because when we put a family into homelessness, it takes a long time and a lot of resources, there's a lot of trauma invested to get them back out of homelessness. So if we can prevent it on the front side, we will do so much more benefit for our community and keep ourselves healthier and happier. Um, and with that, the mental health side, right? There's just not the support for that. And Emily, you talked about it as well. It's, it's it, we might have 51 beds in Longmont, but that bed can only be held for 72 hours if they're put on an M1 hold, but then they can't get in for an assessment. And if that person needs medication, that could be six to nine months out. And when they do meet with that counselor the first time, it's gonna be on a Zoom or a Skype call. And I know that I've been on a lot of Zoom calls and it's very hard to make a connection and I'm sure as heck not gonna share everything that has me hurting that day with somebody on a screen. So in general, we just need to do better. As providers, as a society, as a community, we need to let go of the stigmas and start taking care of each other. Who would like to come next? Yes. Talking about the 50, my name is Denise. Talking about the 51 beds that Longmont has, I have a, a mentally ill son that's 31 years old now. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Woo. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so my name's Denise and I have a 31 year old uh, mentally ill son and obviously he didn't know, even told me the other day, he says, mom, I didn't know what was wrong with me. Very intelligent, but just didn't fit into society and ended up, you know, using the drugs and selling the drugs. And um, but the point I really wanna make is the fact that we don't have a place to even help them get better. And, and you all know that. Um, He's, he's taken himself to the hospital and said, I, I need help. Well, what's wrong with you? Do you have a plan and a time and a way that you're gonna kill yourself? If you don't, you're going back home. You're going, I mean, you're on the streets, you're out, you're out, you're out. So he would, you know, maybe be contemplating suicide. He'd tell, you know, whatever his feelings were and They would call me in the middle of the night because I was his contact, and they would say, "Oh yeah, um, we, we're gonna have you know the so and so from so and so you know talk to him and and uh, we did find him a bed eventually. Oh, we found him a bed. Hmm. Well, where's he going? Well, he's going to Colorado Springs. Now this was from Longmont to Colorado Springs for a 72-hour hold, which wasn't even enough. I'm like. Wow, so here he gets in these transport ambulances or whatever they have, and you're scared to death already, and you're going down I-25, and then you go to another strange place, and then in 72 hours, they're just watching the clock. Okay, you're out, you need your bed. I mean, if you have a heart attack, if you have any problem, I don't recall them looking for you a bed. Why is mental illness of the brain an illness put aside when it has so many repercussions in our society and our life? My son has 75 stitches up and down his arms. He went to Centennial Peaks and in 72 hours, they said he was ready to go. And I said, really? Do you think you could help him a little bit longer? Well, they kept him two more days. 
and he was still furious in his manic state of whatever it was that he did that with, that he didn't even want to come to our house because his brain was you know, just not there exactly. So his brother flew in from California and his dad and I and brother, we went to the, the family meeting at Sunny Tim Hill Peaks on day three and he didn't even want to come home and I couldn't handle him if I wanted to because he was still furious and, and that mixed up when you do that to your body and you look at it. So I said, well, what's going to happen to him? And the social worker said, well, we'll just give him some money and he can go to Denver on the bus and find some, I mean, literally that's all. I mean, if people don't understand really what's going on, it's going on, it's bad. And to think that, um, like I said, he's taken himself to the hospital. Police in Longmont know us. Um, Cora knows us. That's, that's a plus, right? You know, you always want to know all the important people in town. <laughs> because your son, you call and you say, hey, my son isn't doing well today. And he left the house. And I just want you to know what he's wearing. If you see him walking around town and if he's doing something that you don't like, can you please help? Can you not arrest, like, can you, in the core group in Longmont, I, I probably need to talk to the, um, the police department to say how helpful they've been to my family. That's all I know to vouch for is that they've done well. They, they check up on me, they got me counseling. Like, it's just that mental health is, it's just different, you know? It's just not like a broken foot or a heart attack or, you know, we just gonna push you over, because you look okay. You know, you don't really have this broken arm but it's hell. Thank you. Just to talk about mental health, I mean, there, there are no good answers except that they're so overwhelmed that I, there's, there's nothing to say, right? We, we had a client um, last week who had a complete and utter melt a uh, mental break and she had just been gifted a car and believed that the battery acid in the car was seeping through the dashboard and the car's metals were were trying to get into her body and was just becoming completely hysterical in the parking lot and um, we decided to call the mobile crisis team and they came and they said, there's absolutely nothing we can do for you. They have to be actively suicidal, which means literally slitting their throat. I mean, we're talking, they're half dead already or they have to be actively homicidal before we can do anything for them. Um, the, that is such a, a huge gap. I mean, we have all dealt with mental illness on a regular basis and that is the one thing that will keep people down in homelessness. Be, I see this more often becoming a routine thing where someone is released from jail, prison, a treatment center, a mental illness facility, whatever it is, and they've gotten sober, they've gotten on their meds, and they're mentally stable, and then they're released, and they go to a shelter, and they have this gap in their services, meaning, okay, well, their doctor was at the jail. Now they have to find a new doctor who will prescribe them their meds, and there's this gap, and they don't know how to navigate this gap themselves sometimes, and so they will get off their medicine, and that's just, a, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the worst thing that could happen, because now they're unstable again, and they're probably going to go back and use again, and then they're right back where they started. Can I, can I yeah. add to that? Um, and just, just to be clear that when they come out of a facility, if they were sent out with medication, they're given either a three to five day bridge. Um, so they need to find somebody that's going to prescribe those meds and it goes back to having six to nine months before you can see that. But on the flip side of what happens with that is you call a crisis unit, which has a police officer and some kind of mental health worker with them. If they can't take them because they don't have any, um, reason they're not suicidal in that particular moment, meaning they're physically damaging themselves, the only other option is, is to criminalize that behavior. Mm -hmm. So in order for them to be taken someplace where they can be safe, which would be jail, which we all know is not an ideal place for somebody to go that's in mental crisis, um, they end up having a big 
um, criminal history behind them. And if you look at that criminal history, it's all very minor. And it's things like trespassing, you know, acting crazy in the park, um, scaring the neighbors, harassment, yelling, belligerence. And it really just goes back to they needed some help and support around their mental health. They needed somebody to see them and listen to them and have that their, their best being taken care of, and we miss that beat. So we end up criminalizing mental health and homelessness, and then that creates a whole other basket of just chaos for them to navigate through. Well, talk about just breaking the complexity of the issues open even more. And I have a question because a couple of the stories have talked about uh, caregiver duress, emotional and financial. Uh, how might any of you speak to that and how we can understand the support that's needed for those that are in caregiver roles or simply the really good friend that's the one person that somebody who's suffering from mental illness might trust? At Hope, excuse me, at Hope what we're learning is that when we try and connect with families of individuals who are homeless and have some severe mental health issues, then we get to see just the impact over 20, 30 years that that mental illness has affected that family to such a degree that even if they wanted to figure out how to accept their child, their adult child back in their life, they know that they just don't have the capacity anymore because there was no respite 10 years ago. There was no respite 20 years ago. Um, when I was a special ed teacher, we worked with a program where uh, parents had the availability to have a respite weekend once a month, and that was the saving grace of being able to move forward of dealing with a severe developmentally disabled child and when I think about these families that I used to be like what's wrong with this family that they won't take their son back until they started telling me their story they are forever changed because of the the family member so it, it is a problem we don't have a crisis center here in town our hospitals end up being the crisis center it's a it's a serious problem I, I just had a, a memory of the movie um, You've Got Mail with Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And in it, Meg Ryan has this one point where she, <laughs> she says such a great statement because all along, Tom Hanks is saying, oh, it's not personal, it's just business. Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't get that. And I think that that's coming forward very strong for me is that it is always personal. Everything we're talking about is personal. And the stories in your own life parallel these stories, maybe not in magnitude, or maybe in ways that have resolved, and we're talking about unresolved issues, but we all have the same stories. We're all on this healing process. There's always been a moment in someone's life when they were in true need, maybe even just emotionally. Maybe you were eight years old and you were crying and nobody held you. It can be as simple as that. We've all got our stories to relate here that can help us get really close and intimate to how personal this is as a human species and the commitment then that is part of what it means to be human, I, I believe. so. Uh, who else would like, yes, come. Kim, you're a gifted facilitator. I never thought I'd hear rom-com at anything like this, so thank you so much. Um, so I, I just wanted to say to the panel, I'm Eric, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your stories. And, and I have to share with you one of the things that I hear at the foundation all the time is, is that, well, if we provide such great services, others are going to come here and we're gonna be overrun, and I'm just saying what I hear and people tell me. So what would be your response to that? I'm just curious. I think we have to stay professional on that one, but. Um, <laughs> 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 um, you know, honestly, I think that that myth has been debunked, meaning um, 
the systems were torn down during COVID. There, there weren't access to as many services because we had to be, you know, six feet apart and certain, you know, agencies could no longer offer day services. And, and for whatever reason, you know, a lot of services went away. But we didn't see homelessness go away. We didn't see the encampments quit growing. We didn't see them disappear. We didn't see them get smaller. It's the opposite, in fact. Um, so even though we don't have as many services and the, if we build it, they will come. That was a great movie. It was a great line in a movie. Um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not, in fact, true. Um, what we're doing is we're just not serving the folks that need it. We're, we're leaving the most vulnerable of our population to fend for themselves without any resources. And that, that is just probably, maybe I should have shared that with, you know, some of the, the thoughts of, you know, they're lazy and pulling their, themselves up. But the more robust services that we can put in place, that is how you change homelessness. And that is how you impact those that are living on the streets. It doesn't matter if somebody came from Colorado Springs up here. It doesn't matter if they came from Wyoming here. They are here in our community. They're not gonna go away. They're gonna have police out. They're gonna have EMS. They're gonna have fire. They're gonna be in the hospital. They're gonna be in our courts. They're gonna be in the front of our storefronts. We have to serve the people that are in our community regardless of where they came from. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I recently asked some of my staff this exact question, what their response would be, and it was, so what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Er, thanks for that prompt, Eric, because that was the, one of the things we actually did talk about when we, we gathered prior to, to uh, being here tonight and uh, you know build it and they will come is 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 also a fallacy too and you know there's always an element of some truth of, or grains of truth in anything when we talk about uh, you know don't give any money to the person on the street corner they're just gonna use it for drugs or whatever there's an element of all of that that is true sure um, and, but 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 that's uh, again we're, we're gonna if we go down that path of over general or generalizing or or, um, or just assuming that that is always the case uh, that's where it, again we're flawed so um, we have, uh, you know, I think what we can see, there are many agencies, by the way, do have some um, criteria around uh, um, establishing residency and things like that. And so there are agencies that operate like that. And so, so if you just showed up yesterday from, you know, Florida, you may not be able to get services at some, some agencies due to the, um, that residency requirements. And so, so some of those safeguards are in place um, for those kinds of things. Um, should it matter, you know, that's a, you know, certainly a, a, a comment that's worth, um, you know, having a conversation around. But, um, but by and large, when we see that uh, it wasn't long ago, LHA, Longmont Housing Authority, um, once again, brought up opportunity for those um, who are eligible to seek Section 8 uh, vouchers. And, and when we see that we have, well, Nelly Berto's here this evening, you know, I don't know in the end what our final numbers were compared to the numbers of vouchers that were given out. Um, it speaks to the need, you know, the need is vast. And so when we, when we do have uh, supports in place, um, you know, that need was already there. And so it's, it's n it, it, there's, there's not enough resources for the, the vast need that is there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm not sure that, that I necessarily get caught up in thinking that we're gonna spend all these resources and then the people are gonna come from everywhere around the country. Um, they're, they're already here, you know, really. I don't know if this answers your question, no, 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 but no, but eight out of ten women and transgender individuals at my shelter are running from domestic violence, and I'm not going to turn someone away who came from Illinois, running from their abuser, and I'm not going to tell them you can't be here. You need to go back to Illinois where your abuser is. There's just no way I'm going to do that. And I think if we change our mindset, and uh, you know, we need to change the way that we view this and the way that we discuss these issues but instead of being afraid of what others think or you know having those con and, and there's a lot of conflict there's a lot of different you know beliefs and different opinions um, we just need to be trendsetters and we just need to pave the way and lead by example so I think um, you know if, if you as a policymaker start to make the right changes other people will follow 
And it's okay to have those difficult conversations. We encourage those, but putting things into action is much more um, rewarding than just having the talk. So I think if you're a trendsetter and you're just making those policies and you're implementing them, people will follow suit. And I think that there's a lot of people that are waiting for somebody else to start something so that they can jump in because that's their belief too. It's sometimes hard to have the one, you know, be the voice in the room that speaks up. I mean, there's a great saying that says, you know, you need to say what you need to say, even if your voice shakes. And that's, that's how I kind of view the work that we do. I would like to add that um, we have reunified last year, 2021, 18 people who came here and realized they were running away from someone. And a lot of our organizations will help with this to reunite people with family and friends. We call first and uh, 18 people who are like, you know, um, I, it, the grass is greener in Colorado, right? And uh, we reunite, reunited them with families and friends and they're still successful. So maybe some people are hearing that people are coming here for resources while there are some people realizing that if someone could just help them get back to family and friends. I'm, I don't want to belabor this, but there is also the flip side of that conversation too, or that argument in that we are also losing people too in this community who are, fr you know, I, I don't know what from here means if you were you know, born here, if that's you, you, yeah. like an indictment on whether or not you belong. I don't think that is the case. Uh, um, Colorado is famous for its transplants it coming from everywhere else. So. Um, but regardless of that, we are losing people to our community due to the affordability uh, issue around housing. And so we, we have those who um, otherwise uh, may call Longmont and the surrounding area home, but, but um, or want it to be, but can't. And so, so there's another side of that too, that, it's that it, it's, uh, retention of people who are residents of this area is also a problem for us. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And I've got a question that kind of comes at it a different uh, angle, and that's this um, this way we're influenced by the notion it's better to give than to receive. I think that's really deeply in our culture. There's a lot of awards built in if you have that attitude. It's better to give than to receive, and yet uh, it's when we don't receive what we need that sometimes we become hardened to the ability to receive I was working in a shelter when I was 19 in Santa Cruz and I was doing intake and we had like these agencies, we had like every resource, everyone had risen up with all these resources. People could get education for free and cars and the, the community had rallied back in the 80s and I was doing intake with um, a man who had become very bitter against the system. And it seemed from out the outside that he just wasn't being grateful. He just, it's right there, he's just not grateful for what all we have. But behind that face and that attitude was a person that had been deeply hurt at times of truly needing support and not receiving it. And I'd like to invite any of the panelists to speak to that, that giving and that receiving and how hard, it's hard for I think any of us to receive sometimes. Maybe a compliment, you know, on a much minor level. How might you speak to that, the way it influences the work we do. So I think I think sometimes it's hard to even ask. It's not so much as receiving, but it's hard to step up and ask. And if you've been on the street for a while, um, people don't generally see you. They look past you. They see the sign. They see the dirt. They see the smell. They see the problem. So then it becomes even harder to step up and ask. And that's where it goes to. You know, Tim kind of shared the relationship part is we have to keep having positive engagements yeah. with folks that are needing services so that they can get to the place where they're comfortable enough to even ask. And I think before they can receive anything, they have to be in a safe enough space where they can ask for it. And they are the experts of their, their future. They, know, they have all of the answers. They just need a space that they can also share those and ask for help to get to that, get to that point. But that, that's, a great, that's a great point, and you worded it so eloquently. Thank you. minutes before we bring Joan up. Any other questions or comments or contributions? Joan, may I give you the microphone? Hello. This is 
has been very humbling to listen to. Um, I was thinking about when you were talking about the myths, the thing that I've heard is from people is, well, why don't you just do this? And because that would be their one solution, a very simple solution to an incredibly complex challenge. So um, I, every time you mention something, I could comment on it. Uh, the one thing I do want to tell you is that I, I care very deeply about this issue. Um, and I was on a call today where the uh, county was going to made an ordinance, but we got that stopped. So um, again, it was criminalizing, for me, it's criminalizing homelessness. So um, there are a lot of things that we can do, and the city manager and I have been talking about a lot of things. What I had brought to him right after I got elected is I want a campus to the point that this uh, panel was making is that in Longmont we give people uh, a list of where they can go for certain services. Well, if you're mentally ill, you're not gonna be able to figure out, do I go on Kaufman Street? Do I go over to Martin Street? Where's the hour center? I have no transportation. I've got all my stuff in a shopping cart. And it is so overwhelming. It is so demeaning. So my vision is that we have a campus where all our services are in one building, which is what we really need. But until someone has a place to lay their head and they know that that is there for them, it's really hard to address anything else in your life. And when Shannon was talking about um, the, the girl that was, the woman that was needed a job, et cetera, the one thing she didn't mention was food because all day long you have to figure out where you're gonna get food. How are you gonna eat? Are they gonna let you in? Do you stink? Is anybody, it, it's very difficult. So um, we are working on this and as I mentioned before, I met with Longmont United Hospital because what the city manager and I both know is that we need beds in this uh, community and are there beds that the city can lease in Longmont United Hospital because it isn't full is there a floor we can lease? Is there, because to the point of, re, of um, discharging people after 72 hours when they are not capable of being discharged and where do they go? We've had people in Longmont discharged from hospitals that have died under trees because they were not ready, they weren't well and their wounds hadn't healed. Uh, there was no one caring for them. So it's very important that we have a place where a person can stay for a week. But the answer, and this is to me, and I totally get this, the operating costs of doing that, who's going to pay for the nurses, who's going to pay for the caseworkers, the mental health. And to that end, I did make a motion that we put so many dollars every year in an ongoing, uh, ongoing basis for mental health, unhoused, and addi addiction. So that we have some dollars <laughs> It isn't going to be enough, but it's something along with other uh, things. The other thing I really want to do is to buy a shower truck because to the same point, you don't want to go into an interview if you've been sleeping in the same clothes for a week or if you, you know, it, it, it just is too overwhelming. There are a lot of issues. So anything that we can do, the discussion is ongoing. We're going to have a, a big meeting with, um, city staff uh, in a couple of weeks to address some issues, some, not issues, some suggestions as resolutions to see if the staff thinks it's a good idea, if our legal department thinks it's a good idea, if uh, the city managers think it's a good idea, and then if they do, if they edit it for us and figure out what will work, then we will take it to the service providers and say, do you think this might be a little way that we can make a difference? So we're always working on it. Uh, any ideas, like they said, any ideas, please bring them because it is overwhelming. We'll never get, get rid of homelessness. And um, like I told the, the doctor when we were at Longmont United Hospital, because people think that we will get over it, I, I said, isn't that what the Good Samaritan story was all about? That person they helped was homeless. So, you know, it, it's not something we're ever truly going to solve, but we, ha we cannot stop working on it and trying. 
So thank all of you for coming. Thank you, guys. I learned a lot, and it just breaks my heart. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. Hopefully in this discussion, as we're learning from each other, uh, one of the many takeaways is the realization that you are the greatest asset to this issue. It's you. While it may be daunting and it may seem overwhelming and you may seem powerless to be an agent for sustaining sustainable change, you are the greatest asset. I've written a lot of grants for Hope over the past two years, and our greatest cost is what? Our staff, because our staff are the way we make the difference in the work we do. And way back in the Industrial Revolution, when you saw the spreadsheets, you what happens? Equipment was put as an asset, and people were considered a liability. So we have the chance to change that by recognizing that each one of us is an asset as well in being a cause for change here. So we have, on that note, we've got some action steps. So all, there are many of you that got a tiny little piece of paper out there. If you're willing and courageous, I want to invite you to stand up with that piece of paper. These action steps came forward from our panelists here. I also have a hard copy of all of them on one sheet. And you can also email me and I'll send the digital copy. Just to remember, there are practical action steps that we can be doing that help shift and lead towards a uh, change that's lasting. So if you have your action steps, stand up. And if you're comfortable coming to the mic, come to the mic. Otherwise, just shout it out from where you are. Entertain the idea of a low barrier hub as the right door for anyone who is in a need of housing. Perhaps on-site basic services would exist with immediate navigation of rapid rehousing for families and individuals. Amen. Right. Yes. Talk to your local policymakers, politicians, about what they're doing to support homeless providers. How can we better serve the unhoused population? Low barrier service options, one stop shop, better, better funded resources. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Support efforts to expand and create additional below market retail inventory for all subpopulations such as elderly, working families, et cetera. Yes? Yes. Get to know a homeless person. Yes. Nice. nice. <coughs> Consider involving your churches, to any extent, small or large, to assist with the issue or to invite nonprofits to speak on the subject of homelessness to smaller groups. And I would add one thing to that. Um, I serve on the board of the in-between, and we had a situation where a church actually donated some land where we were able to build housing for some senior homeless people. Oh. So it's all kinds of possibilities okay. with your church. Mm -hmm. Thank you for nice. sharing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Service providers start to communicate and work with state, city, and county stakeholders to rebuild the system so that we better meet the needs for those seeking services. Well, it's been an honor to be able to be the moderator of this discussion. Hopefully, it'll be one of many. And let's give a round of applause for these amazing panelists willing to sit up here. And please stay around a little bit. We've got a little bit more time, and there are lots of sweets. There's fruit and brownies and cheese. Get yourself something more to drink, too. Thank you so much.